Friday of Bay Hill News Network. We do Facebook Live for church service, funeral service, lecture, sporting activity. For more, contact at Bay Hill News Network at gmail.com or call 1784-529-8340. Ship your barrels and household effects to St. Vincent and the Grenadines with SVG Direct. Jumbo barrels, $70. Medium, $60. And small, $50. We ship anything, name it. We ship it. Vehicles and more. Local agent, Adams Customs and Shipping Agency. Third floor, Baines Building, Kingstown, SVG. Telephone, 1784-458-1328. In Canada, contact Michael, 647-569-3285. Jumbi, 647-657-7362. Remember, it's free pickup at your convenience. Seven days per week, anywhere in the greater Toronto area with SVG Direct. Great news. Spectra Plus is now rolling out internet and TV services in St. Lucia and St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Yes, better service and better prices from the new and improved Spectra Plus. Spectra Plus TV plans for $59.99 per month. That included adult TV three channels plus $29.99. For more information, call 1784-534-2551 or 1784-532-2501. Fast, reliable broadband and television services for your home or business. Spectra Plus TV Internet Better. Night Radio's Kalulu presents Just Another Look. Just Another Look is an innovative, exciting, albeit decidedly provocative and yes, yes, certainly controversial, socio-political analysis of issues of a local, regional and international nature. Just Another Look is heard only on Nice Radio, first aired on Saturdays at 6 p.m. with repeat broadcasts on Sundays at 9 p.m. Remember, you can catch us on the World Wide Web, www.nightradio.info. I am, of course, Keith Joseph. Today, dear friends, is Saturday. It is the third day of April, 2021. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another edition of your favorite program, Just Another Look. Before we get into the crux of of this week's edition of Just Another Look, We want to ask a few questions in relation to the state of affairs at Digicel. Now, we know that we have two main telecommunications agencies or institutions in this country, Flow and Digicel. And historically, there have been challenges on both sides. And they have focused on going after each other, going after each other, going after each other. But over the last several months, we've gotten more than a little bit concerned about what is really happening in these institutions. There's a tendency in sentences and identities for us to only address matters when they have reached crisis point. And there are some matters which when they are raised are very quickly swept under the carpet. One of the things that has happened with the onset of the enhancement 
of technology and the improvements, advancements of technology over the past several years has been that things are moving so fast. And the marketing strategies have been so improved that people are caught up in the acquisition of new devices, regardless of cost, but they are also caught up in ensuring that they are at the most advanced stage. There is little attention paid to cost anymore. So, whereas in the past, many people were very clear as to how much money was spent on their telephone bills per year, per month, per year. Now, with all of the little offerings, promotional uh, programs of the major communications network, people don't really particularly the young people don't really know how much money they spend on their cell phones the use of the internet for what whatever reason on a monthly basis for example because they are caught up with the double bubble they are caught up with the extra specials they are caught up with this they are caught up with that and they're thinking oh I'm getting more and more time I'm having more and more time and not being overly concerned about I'm spending more and more money, I'm spending more and more money. Advanced technology, while significantly improving the way in which we communicate, comes at a price. And unfortunately, the younger generation, being attracted by newer, ever newer devices, pay little or no attention to cost. And of course, in many of our societies, um, we know that um, young men can't always afford the devices that their girlfriends want. And increasingly, you have seen their girlfriends turning, uh, turning to older persons who can afford their expense accounts, leaving the young boys very often on the side. But there are other things that we wanted to talk about. Because it has to do with the livelihoods of people. You remember, and we've talked about it here on several occasions, how Glenn Jackson got involved in the battle against cable and wireless at the time and got incensions to be so incensed about the way they were being treated by cable and wireless that they pulled their phones through the streets of Kingstown. Didn't matter that they had to go home with them afterwards and clean them up to use the very night. But they got the people to vent their anger at cable and wireless marching around Kingstown. But those days we often don't remember because they appear to have been so far so long ago. But on the 17th of June 2020, Caribbean Ronda, an online document, had an article on Antigua. It was written by Azad Ali. And that article, 17th of June 2020, re reads in part, and we quote, Antigua and Barbuda government has reiterated its position that it is prepared to acquire the shares of financially strapped Irish-owned telecommunications company Digicel if it is unable to provide a service in the island in the future. Prime Minister Gaston Brown noted that Digicel is in trouble at the moment. 
we will buy it provided we get a good price and by doing so tens of millions of dollars repatriated to Ireland on an annual basis could stay here creating more opportunities for the people of Antigua and Barbuda. End of quote. So, Gaston Brown was making that announcement because of something else that had happened. Right? Digicel Group One Limited, the Bermuda-based holding company, had announced that it had, it had gone into provisional liquidation in that country and that it had also filed for Chapter 15 recognition at U.S. Bankruptcy Court in Manhattan. That's a quotation from the same article. Digicel Group One Limited, the Mobuda-based holding company, announced that it had gone into provisional liquidation there and has also filed for Chapter 15 recognition at U.S. Bankruptcy Court in Manhattan. End of quote. And then, Alan Burkett Gray of Capacity Media had previously written, because his article was on the 20, in, in May of 2020, he wrote since in May, before, that, and this is the backdrop to what, why Gaston Brown made his comments. Quote, Digicel, the Caribbean and Pacific mobile operator, has filed for bankruptcy, saying it has and the quoting from Digicel itself, unsustainable levels of indebtedness. Unsustainable levels of indebtedness. Burkett Gray's article continues. According to filings in New York, it, meaning Digicel, or, or, right, has 7.4 billion U.S in outstanding debt 7.4 billion US dollars in outstanding debt with revenues for the year ending March 2020 just 2.3 billion and operating profit only 479 million KPMG the accounting firm has been appointed provisional liquidators. Burkett Gray goes on and we quote, The company is largely owned by Dennis O'Brien, the Irish businessman, who made a fortune by building Ireland's first competitive mobile operator, Isat Digifone, which he sold to BT and later became O2 Ireland. Digicel has already made an earlier attempt to restructure its operations, but now it has told the Securities and Exchange Commission, the U.S. financial regulator, that it now wants to offer its Pacific business as security to creditors. That business is worth $941 million in a debt restructuring. The group was not listed, having abandoned an attempt to float shares in 2015. But because it had issued bonds in the U.S., it has to report its finances to the Securities and Exchange Commission there. According to its filings, it made a combined net loss of almost 700 million U.S. dollars in the three and a half years to September 2019. An analysis in the Irish Times says that KPMG has calculated that a fire sale of its assets would raise 
484 million to 629 million. <coughs> the group has businesses in Papua New Guinea and five other island nations in the Pacific. Fiji, Nauru, Samoa, Tonga, and Vanuatu, with 2.5 million customers between them. But its main focus is the Caribbean and Central America, where its businesses range from French Guyana on the South American mainland to Jamaica in the Caribbean to El Salvador on the east coast of Central America. End of quote. So that is the international scenario in which Digicel has formed itself. Now we in the Caribbean and we in St. Vincent and Grenadines had only heard a piece of the news. For whatever reason, the Vincentian media didn't seem to have an interest in following up on what are the implications for our country. What are the implications for the persons employed by Digicel in St. Vincent and Grenadine? Digicel is in several Caribbean islands. Many of them, or all of them, are members of CARICOM. One would have thought, therefore, that CARICOM would have looked at Digicel very circumspectly and immediately engaged in an investigation into exactly what are the implications for their employees. But this is CARICOM, the region's biggest talk shop that talks a lot and does very little. You're seeing that now with the coronavirus, but that shouldn't surprise you because you've seen it before with a whole range of issues. Okay? The OECS is just as bad or perhaps even worse because the Liat workers are still stranded. One would have imagined that the governments, because they are elected by the people, would have been seeing the people's interests as particularly important and allow themselves to rise above the crabs in a barrel syndrome and insularity to discuss in a more systematic manner the well-being of the former employees of Liat. But in 2020, May, when Digicel filed for bankruptcy, the region didn't have much to say. Gaston Brown in Antigua and Barbuda put up his hands and said, well, look, if they're in so much of trouble and they're willing to sell, we're willing to buy. Right? But there has not been a collective response from the governments of the Caribbean. So they don't seem to be concerned that whatever happens to Digicel may well have an impact. Digicel, for its part, had a different thing. You know, it's not, not going to operate, uh, impact their operations. And so we may recall that at the time of the releases about the bankruptcy filing, we were told then that a spokesperson for Digicel, quote, said the moves would not impact regular operations of the company and were aimed at strengthening the balance sheet. End of quote. <laughs> we read to you a while ago, right? That Digicel, Digicel announced at its filings in New York when it was looking for bankruptcy 
that it has 7.4 billion US dollars in outstanding debt. 7.4 billion dollars in outstanding debt. And that the revenues for the year ending March 2020 was only 2.3 billion. The operating profit was only 479 million. So how were they planning? to address the 7.4 billion US dollar outstanding debt. Huh? Nobody in the Caribbean seemed concerned about that. And because you were perhaps embracing Digicel, it is satisfactory that Digicel could say to you, the moves would not impact regular operations of the company and were aimed at strengthening the balance sheet. That's what they say, you know. That's what they tell you. So just another look, therefore, is asking, since the foregoing matters reached the public domain in 2020, it is true to say that we have heard precious little about these claims and their consequences and the processes in which the company has been engaged from the Vincentian government and even less from Digicel itself. So it's all right for Digicel to simply get up and say, don't worry, don't worry about our indebtedness. We will deal with that. But whatever we're doing and what you hear about, with KPMG being liquidators and so on and so on, we're filing for, for, um, for bankruptcy and so on. Don't let that bother your head because it does, not, it does not impact the normal operations. That song familiar? Just another look is bothered. And so we are forced to ask, what has been the implications for Digicel's operations in St. Vincent and the We are concerned about Vincentian workers. Is everybody complaining about the vaccines and the vaccines and the vaccines and how some countries, you know, looking after the people first? Which country doesn't do that? Which, which government doesn't do that? Which government can find itself so foolhardy that it will cut off its nose to spoil its face? They're elected by the people of their country to look after their well-being. They have to do that first. But we are asking, how come we don't appear to be doing that in the case of Digicel? When Flo was going through all of its tra -la -la, tra -la -la, trials and tribulations, everybody was worried. And we watched how they started, and they started moving senior staff. Why? Because they are higher paid. And so you cut a lot of slack when you give them packages and let them go home. Right? Because you cut off the top. You bring up, right? So the fellows who are lower down, who now find themselves in higher positions, not getting the same kind of salaries that the fellows before them used to get. You saw that also at ECGC, when ECGC was going through its, 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 its problems after the end of the incentive period. It's the reason we keep asking you to put on <laughs> your thinking cap, your critical thinking skills cap. Because these things have implications because if people lose their jobs, we're looking at increased poverty. We're looking at increased poverty. We have spoken already about the insensitivity of the current government administration in this country. You don't see them running up 
to the people who were employed in Peter's Hope to try to help them. Instead of finding ways to lease the land in Bookament to Sandals, we sell it. Then they're talking about who selling our birthright. They're selling it. They could have leased the property. Why you want to give us a story about how important it was to sell it for them? So we have to ask ourselves whether in the case of Digicel, the administration does not seem interested in getting to the bottom of it. Because if you're a company operating in my, in my country, and I have an interest, a vested interest in the well-being of the people of the country and the implications for our economy and our society, then I need to know. I need to call you in immediately and tell you, let me, let, me, let me understand what is happening here. But I could also call my Caribbean colleagues and say, look, this is an organization that is in all of our countries. Let us, as an institution, a regional institution, interested in the people of the, and the well-being of the people of the region, we will conduct our own investigation as to the implications of what is happening to Digicel. We have a, a certain callousness, you know. Because it's the same way when Scotia Bank was moving out of the region. You didn't hear it first in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. You heard it because Gaston Brown, the same Prime Minister of Antigua and Barbuda, raised Cain and said to Scotia Bank, Hello, it's not so we do things here. We have rules. We have rules. And so the delay in terms of the widespread sale of Scotia Bank in these smaller islands were held up because one Prime Minister showed that he had testicular fortitude, Gaston Brown. He wanted answers. He wanted to know how things were going to impact his people in his country and whether or not they were following the laws. We didn't have anything to say. People just learned that the institution was sold. The same way other financial institutions in this country have either been sold or in negotiations to be sold. If you follow the regional scenario, you will understand the, 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 the back and forth that has been going with regard to FCIB. No government in this country, no government official is attempting to tell us was well, something happening here, exactly what is happening. Why is it that some of the strongest Canadian banks are finding it critical to leave our shores? Why? What has happened in the international banking industry? Why is there not a fulsome discussion on that? We have all sorts of explanations being given. Is it that we believe that the people will forget it and only feel it? Because you're not talking about it. It's not brought front and, front and center. It is not part of your promise of a consultative democracy. So we don't seem to be bothered by these things that are going to ultimately affect the quality of lives of, our, of the quality of life of our people. So RBTT, has it been sold or, or, or not sold? The people of the country had not been given a full explanation of that. What other financial institution is being sold? Are we being told the whole truth as it happens? Or is the government attempting to suggest, well, these are sensitive negotiations and you only need to know about it when um, the whole deals are, are, are tied up? Remember, you know, and Amusus told us that he had been asked by the people responsible for the negotiations at the National Commercial Bank at the time. He had been asked and urged not to have his members speak about the issue because they were negotiating to sell the bank. 
And he honored that. He honored that. And yet when the bank was sold, some clown had the audacity to go and say they were making much ado about nothing, those fellas in opposition. Instead of being grateful that Eustace allowed his members to still their tongue while the negotiations were taking place. Matters not, we had another idiot come and say that the, the hundred million that we had um, from CDB that came with the caviar that we had to dispense to the, the assets of, of National Commercial Bank was a master stroke. Well, that idiot still exists and, and still talking nonsense. Because the Unity Labour Party seemed to breed that, those kinds of, 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 of individuals. It was a master stroke. We sell a national treasure. We sell something that we thought was going to enhance and, 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 and exhibit our independence. And a clown gets up and says, it's a master stroke. <laughs> it's a master stroke. <laughs> you know, that, that, is, that is what we live, you know. And that's why we are raising the question, if Digicel is in so much trouble in 2020, May, June 2020, what is the status of Digicel today? How has it resolved its indebtedness? And what are the implications for us? Are our Vincentian employees at Digicel at risk? Or you prefer to wait later? If it gets worse, and suddenly Jesus tell his side, we're gone, we're busting it. Then you turn around and you'll tell the people what? When the election time comes, you'll give some money. So we are asking what has been the implications of Digicel's operations in this country since May, June 2020, when the declaration that we read about earlier, when those declarations were made. Are the Digicel workers in our country being guaranteed continue, continued, un, continued employment? And for how long? For how long? What exactly? I mean, because you see, with the pandemic now, companies can do all kind of little shenanigans, you know. You can get two days on, two days off. You can get three days on, three days. There are all sorts of little things that they're doing, right? Because the, 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 the pandemic offers them a way out. We want to know what is the situation with the workers at Digicel. Are they being paid consistently or are they being asked to accept less? What exactly is the plight of the workers of Digicel? Right? What kind of labor practices has the company implemented since the bankruptcy announcements? And how have these affected the gainful employment of people at Digicel in St. Vincent and Grenadines? How? And what about the, 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 uh, 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 what about the ambassadors? Yeah? They tell us about the ambassadors. They have this big program. What, what exactly is the status of that? In terms of employment security in terms of payment, remuneration. You see, just another look is raising these questions about Digicel and his workers in our country because these are difficult economic times. They are difficult for companies, they are difficult for employees. And consequently, one has to, to be concerned. One has to be concerned. It's our people. And if the government doesn't appear willing to discuss it, then we have a responsibility to raise it. It is important for all of us. Extremely important for all of us.
Just another look is concerned as to why the government of this country has not been at the forefront of calling for a full-scale investigation as to the implications of whatever is happening with Digicel at the broader international level for the Vincentian scenario. That's important for us. This government has shown what some may well think is callousness in respect of the former Liat employees from this country. Callous. We are now being told, for example, oh, you know, we've been having sales of the equipment and other pieces of, of things down at Bocamend Bay Resort. We've been having auctions. Yeah? And we are being told that the sales. The monies emerging from the sale will go towards compensating the workers who suddenly lost their job. Now we're doing that, eh? You say we're giving them things. But the process may well have done with a lot more national exposure as to how it was to be done, how it was to be conducted. But look at how long the workers have been left out hanging, hanging out to dry. People who were formerly employed under whatever conditions at the Black Sand Tourism Project in Peter's Hope, they have to contend now with loss of employment as they watch the grass overrun the partially constructed facilities. That's what we have. You see, we have a habit in this country of singing the praises and counting the chickens long before the eggs prove useful. We do that all the time. So when the people were coming for Black Sands, we were anxious to declare the future of black sands. Yeah. And then suddenly things started to ebb and flow, ebb and flow. And you remember that in the lead up to the last elections in November of last year, what? The black sands area was cleaned up. And we asked now, was it to give the impression, hey, this is one of our projects, you know, remember we are in a hotel building spree, we're building Holiday Inn Express, we're building Marriott, we're building the mill, we have in the, 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 all sorts of things. Hotels oozing out of your ears. So was that the impression to clean up Black Sands? Because now we know that they're questioning whether Black Sands was a, was a swindle, a scheme of some sort. Now, now, after the fact, but just a few months ago, in the lead up to the general election, you weren't being told that. The same way they sang the praises of the geothermal energy project. Before we were finished, we were boasting. Before we found anything useful, we were boasting that we, the, 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 the possibility, the potential is such that we may even be able to sell energy to Barbados. That's the nonsense we were talking. Because we were projecting something that, as it turned out, never materialized. Nobody comes and apologizes for that. You know. So we have this habit. That's why in one of the later issues we're going to talk about in this program, where the, the, the nonsense comment that, that was made in, in Parliament about the 200 Vincentian workers going to Turks and Caicos and Sanders, and you hear the response from Turks and Caicos. That's what we do. 
we so anxious to have the people believe we're doing so much for them that we start to talk about things and profitability and viability before there is evidence of such. And nobody comes back and apologizes to the Vincentian electorate for the nonsense that you would have done. Nobody. And that's why we're asking you, did you think it important enough once you heard what was happening with digital to call them in and say, hey guys, come, 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 let's sit down here. When you heard Gaston Brown start talking about the possible buyout of their shares in Antigua and Barbuda, didn't it register someplace? Perhaps we should have a broader CARICOM discussion. You know, all, you, all you all do at CARICOM is talk anyway. But no, that's not our style. And so just another look is asking for a fulsome investigation into exactly what is happening with Digicel now. What's happening now and the implications for the workers at all levels? What exactly is the state of Digicel in St. Vincent and the Grenadines? Its implication, the implications for the workers at all levels, the implications for the Vincentian economy. Will you just wake up one morning and hear Digicel gone? Who then will take responsibility? Come and cry wolf. We cannot afford to have the incentions employed with Digicel end up like those in Peter's Hope. In the Peter's Hope project. Or like those in Liat. Or like those at the Pokemon Bay Resort who have to wait for you to sell out some of the things in order for you, for you to tell them that they like likely to get some money. If that is the way we are doing things, then we, we are in a sad way. But dear friends, this is the Easter weekend. And even as we, as Christians, Celebrate the resurrection of Christ. We are ever mindful, especially in these times, of the anniversary of Mama Sufre's violently explosive eruption of 1979 on the 13th of April, Good Friday. Good Friday. There is no doubt that at the time, in 1979, some may well have thought that the world as we know it was at an end. Many Vincentians were genuinely scared. And the vast majority of Vincentians prayed for God to be fully in control. Prayed for God to bring an end to the eruption. Prayed to God to allow all Vincentians to be safe. Tuesday the 13th of April, 10 days from now, will mark the 42nd anniversary of the last eruption of Mama Sufri. And despite all that may seem otherwise, Vincentians are genuinely scared once more. They're scared over this Easter weekend, and they're scared that the eruption can take place at all in and around the same time. But it's interesting because when we revisit the history of volcanic eruptions in Sufri, of Mama Sufri, we have the first recorded eruption of Mama Sufri was in March in 1718, according to David Bile. March of 1718. 
the second recorded eruption was in April of 1812. And in the 1902 eruption started in May, March 1718, April 1812, May 1902, and 13th April 1979. March, April, May, those three months. We are in April again. And the seismic activity has been such that there is good reason for all of us to pray while preparing for another possible explosive eruption of Mama Sufri. So, reference to being on borrowed time. Not sure if that is the comment you wanted to make, but that's what was said. The other day we had heightened the activity, then suddenly it stopped. The experts said the rumblings that they was, were, 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 were hearing were from further down. That's why they were not as, as, as volatile. That's why they were not as, 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 as strong. Because they were coming from lower down. One expert says, new magma. And then suddenly it stopped. And as we headed into the Easter weekend, it started again. So we are on orange level. Be prepared. We have an understanding of what that means. But we have to understand that this is something that we have to live with because Mama Sofre sits on a zone which undergirds several of our islands in the Caribbean, where the Caribbean tectonic plate meets the Atlantic tectonic plate, and they fight. They push against each other. That is part of the earth building process. So there's always a chance of hyperactivity at some point. Then by 1902, it wasn't only Mama Sufra here, it was Mont Pele in Martinique. In 1991, you had over in, in Monstrat. Do you remember we have a string of Sufres across the region too? And you also have Kikam Jenny just off the coast, the west coast of Grenada. So we are in a zone. And over the last few months, we have seen heightened seismic activity all over the place. Mount Etna, we have Iceland, the, 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 the Ring of Fire in the Asia Pacific region. It has often been said that Disaster has the capacity to bring people at once closer to God and closer to each other. That is what is normally said. But the more one looks at Vincentian society today, the more one is likely to say that used to be the case. That used to be the case. Thank the politicians for the significant population division that we have in this country today. The nation is divided. But when we have disasters, the disasters don't discriminate on the basis of political affiliation. They don't discriminate on the basis of political affiliation. You notice Mama Sufre, I mean, um, the pandemic, COVID-19, don't discriminate on the basis of political affiliation.
And that is why Richard Brown was able to, to pen his piece to Eyewitness News about his own dissatisfaction with the way he and his family were treated. The level of incompetence and inept ineptness shown by the way in which we responded to the pandemic was epitomizing that. So while in the past we know that disasters bring people together, we're not so sure anymore in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Because of many disasters that have passed, whether it is from strong winds, it is from flooding and, and tropical storms or what have you, the Lives to Live program has shown a distinctive political bias in the way in which It's been the, 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 uh, processed and distributed. So even though people of all political persuasions were affected in the disasters that we've had in the past several years, the rehabilitative work showed an eager return to the political bias. That's what happened in North Leeward after the floods and the loss of life in 2013. Imagine that. In the Christmas season, we have a disaster. People rush to help one another. But when the thing finished, we went back to how we help who based on political affiliation. Indeed, even as people were trying to come to terms with the horrific disaster, and loss of life in North Leeward. Gonzalo comes and sees Animusas at one of the areas where people died. All he could have done was wind down the glass. He didn't even come out to commiserate with users. He wind down the glass to say hello. That is the level of our together now. And we continue to accept that nonsense. Because you can always get the minions ready to defend why he needed to do something like that. You have no interest, therefore, in building a nation. Because nation building is not only one side. It's all of us. But if the first, if the first thing that comes to mind it let me look after our political party supporters. Then we're not into nation building. We are fooling ourselves. We're fooling ourselves. So in spite of the fact that there had been common to say that in times of disaster, people tend to come closer to God and closer to each other. One is not so sure in St. Vincent and the Grenadines anymore. The politics of division have rent us asunder. And we have also, in respect of God, seen a significant shift in our society away from religion. We have been witnessing over the last several years a significant increase in secularization. We have witnessed over the past several years the pathetic clamor for a new morality that dismisses the majority of what was considered important values, guiding principles of life. We have cast those aside. Our new morality is no morality at all. Let's live without it. Good examples are hard to find in Vincentian society. Religiosity is in decline. And the evidence is all around us. The Christian council... The Christian council, imagine that, is itself in a sorry state. 
and has shown itself incapable of fashioning the model togetherness that is needed by the society. Every now and again, they seem to be motivated to have a day of prayer. But the same Christian council appears incapable of engaging Vincentian society into a life of prayer, not a day of prayer, a life of prayer. Because a life of prayer changes lives. But if we have the odd occasion of a day of prayer for this and a day of prayer for that, we are suggesting that our relationship with God and our religion is a seasonal something. It is a seasonal something. It is not a way of life. The politicians have kept the nation in tribal mode. And hence, even with the best of intentions, the politicians constitute a hopeless lot in any attempt at forging national unity. The last set of people in this country who can facilitate national unity are the politicians. When the politicians come and talk to you about togetherness, run for your life. All they appear eager to do is to find new ways of dividing the very society that they wish to lead, to govern. Remember together now? But that never really happened. And just another look is saying, if after 20 years, we don't have an understanding that together now may well never have been intended to be implemented, then we understand. We can look at the man who dared to utter those words. Whereas during the election campaign, the mantra was labor now. Henceforth, it shall be together now. Does he even remember that he said that? And is he willing to say today, 20 something years later, that he meant what he meant when he said that? You've had plenty of opportunities, no shortage of opportunities in the past 20 years to heal this nation and to lead in the healing process. And what has happened? We end up with Daniel Cummins, almost committed to a wheelchair. Because they sat there and watched. They flung him down the steps and you said nothing. Maybe you were maintaining a dignified silence. But when your wife has a critical health situation that could end up with her in a wheelchair, you're telling all of us in the nation. But you're not telling the nation about what you felt honestly about what was done to Daniel Cummins. That is the way this country has been divided under your watch. Is there a sense of care? Can we really believe that you care, that you love? Because the love that you so often want to give the impression is important, the, 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 the agape goes beyond the politics of the day. And that agape would have allowed you to extend that hand to Daniel Cummins. To extend that hand to the leader of the opposition when he committed to wanting to work with you during the pandemic. But the very day of the election victory you had in 2001, you failed to tell the nation. That day, the day after, the months after, never once mentioned to the nation that on the day of your election victory in 2001, Arnim Eustace called and said to you he conceded 
and he was prepared to work with you for the genuine development of this country. Was that too hard for you to repeat? Instead, you found it necessary to tell the nation on the day of your election victory in 2001 that your cousin who was leading the PPN, a nondescript political organization that was never going anywhere, Ken Boy, that he had called to concede. He had less than 1% of the electorate in his corner. But you remember that he called to concede. But he didn't remember to tell the nation that Eustis called to concede and offered to work with you for the genuine development of the country. It's just the same way that in your first independence address, you couldn't bring yourself to talk about the 17 years of the NDP rule and the progress that the country had made since that. You hopscotch over that from K2 to you. How do we expect you to even so much as dare to suggest that you could bring this country together for Mama Sufri? You didn't do it during the pandemic. You didn't do it during Dengue. And you certainly ain't going to be able to do it for Mama Sufri. You don't have the capacity, comrade. You don't have the capacity. Plain and simple. And there's absolutely no reason in your past political performance, particularly since you've been in charge of this country in 2001, you've done nothing to convince people in this country that you have the capacity to genuinely love them to the point of bringing the nation together in harmony. Plain and simple. Plain and simple. That is our reality. That is the painful part of the political process that you have given rise to in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. You have taken us back years to the point where people can look at Vincentian society divided as it is today and conceptualize in their mind's eye what it must have been for the native peoples when we had conquest. That's what we are taking back to today. That is the level of tribalism that we have today. That's why we said, you know, recently, that's why we called for an investigation into what happened to that young man who died from Ovia. Who died, we were told, from COVID-19. And we asked for an investigation for a specific reason. Because we have an understanding of what is happening in the society, even though you may not want to believe much of what people are saying. But you want everybody to believe what you are saying. It doesn't work that way anymore. And much of the information about the pandemic that you have access to, people have access to. Trust, trust us. Communication is at an age where nothing really stays hidden. Except perhaps nasty political secrets and those eventually come to light. The people have access to the same information. And they use that information to determine how they conduct their lives. The Vincentian reality this Easter, dear friends, remains very much characterized by chronic selfishness and political hubris. Vincentian society today is bereft of good examples of leadership, and we pray God that we are spared the worst of any explosive eruption of Mama Sufre. You know, we were talking earlier in the program about the tendency of this government to boast about the benefits of things before they actually begin to materialize. On the 23rd of March 2021, Eyewitness News carried a story that raised in part, quote, the government of Turks and Caicos Islands says it has no plan 
to allow 200 Vincentians to be employed at the Sandals Beaches Resort there, as Minister of Finance Camilo Gonzalez announced in Parliament last week. End of quote. The government of Turks and Caicos Islands says it has no plans to allow 200 Vincentians to be employed at the Sandal Beaches Resort there, as Minister of Finance Camilo Gonzalez announced in Parliament last week. End of quote. So the Turks and Caicos minister rebuffed what was coming over the airwaves. What was on social media? Because the eyewitness news quotes Camilo as saying, quote, as of a few days ago, we had concluded discussion with Sandals Resorts International that will result in Sandals International employing 200 Vincentians within the coming weeks to take up positions at a new beaches resort in TCI, meaning Turks and Caicos Islands. End of quote from Eyewitness News. And just another look is saying, to the average Vincentian, this statement sounded a bit off. Because you weren't talking about 5 people, 10 people, 15 people. You're talking about 200 Vincentians. And we found it a bit off because it appears simply too fanciful for anyone to believe that somehow Sandals, just having acquired a property at Bookament, and with work not yet having gotten started in earnest, would be able to engage 200 Vincentians as employees and cart them off to Turks and Caicos Islands to work in the organization's new beaches resort there, as though there's no governmental authorities, etc., etc., through which they have to pass and get permission to even begin to make that kind of statement. You see, you are forced to ask yourself whether this is responsible government or governance. Whether this is responsible at all. And are we not aware that social media exists so everything you say reaches as far as around the world and as fast as anything else? One would have expected that as this country's Minister of Finance, greater care would have been taken to allow Sanders to make such a claim so that the organization could answer the very questions that were later posed following Gonzalez's announcement. Or should we call it boast? You see, because you let Sanders say this, that's what they're doing. Let Sanders come and make the announcement, but why are you the one making it? They just concluded discussions with Sanders. That will result in sandals carrying 200 Vincentians to Turks and Caicos. We asked, was it that Camilo was more than a little anxious to return to the stage? We asked whether Camilo was more than a little anxious to return to the stage he described on the eve of the most recent general elections here. You remember when he talked about um, he feel he could thump his chest? Huh? And that, that appeared to be re re related to what he thought he had achieved as a politician and why he should be re-elected without any, any, um, any challenge. But he should also have remembered the outcome of his own elections. Well, I've heard Gibson Velux came so close to him that he really couldn't believe he was stunned by the results. And we are just another to explain why you got that result. It had nothing to do with your people staying at home because they felt that you were a win anyway. 
It had to do with a number of issues surrounding you that people may well have been unhappy with. Not the least of which is the fact that people not particularly happy with you being seen as an heir apparent of both heading the party and heading the government. Mm -mm, people don't seem comfortable with that. And the other issue would have been the, the response to the way in which Yugi Farrell was perceived to have been treated. So we want to know whether it is that you were so eager to get back to that point of wanting to feel like a thump bitches. Huh? Countries still have laws. And it is simply not permissible to even so much as contemplate that any company could simply bring in as many employees as it desires from another country and it will all be fine. Not when those countries have the same issues in the face of this pandemic. All of us around the world are affected by the pandemic. Economies around the world are experiencing challenges. But yet you believe that some kind of magic wand could be waved because that looked like a Gonzales trait. They seem to have some kind of magic wand that they could wave. Yeah? And one can only conclude that the way in which and, and the offhandish way and their boastful way in which, in which Camilo made the, 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 the proclamation that maybe, maybe, just maybe, Camillo must have been thinking that we were all living on his father's plantation. That St. Vincent and the Grenadines had become his plantation. And that the government and peoples of the Turks and Caicos Islands were also residents of that plantation. So that is no problem. It's our plantation anyhow. So what about taking a few from here and moving them over there in the way we used to do in the days of slavery? What, 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 so what, what's the big thing about that? That's how it comes across. That is just how it comes across. But we are not living on your father's plantation. St. Vincent and the Grenadines and Turks and Caicos Islands are not your father's plantation. And just in case Camilo et al. may have been living with the wrong analysis of the government and people of Turks and Caicos Islands, that country's Minister of Immigration, Citizenship, Labor, and Employment Services, Arlington Musgrove, put it all in proper perspective. Musgrove said, and we quote, While this may be their plan, it is certainly not the plan of this government when we have so many Turks and Caicos Islanders who are out of work presently. presently. End of quote. Same thing we say. It's not your plantation, bro, nor is it that of your father. While this may be their plan, Musgrove says, it is certainly not the plan of this government when we have so many Turks and Caicos Islanders who are out of work presently. According to Eyewitness News, Musgrove, Musgrove continued, quote, I can assure you that we have not had any discussions along these lines. And in the event we do, we will always look out for the betterment of our people first. End of quote. Charity begins at home. In the event we do, we will always look out for the betterment of our people first. I wonder if we hear that from our government about the intention people. Putting our people first. Because when they were building the Argyle International Airport, just another look at, did we need to bring the Cubans to drive trucks and heavy equipment? Did we not have qualified Vincentians who could have handled the heavy equipment and drive the trucks? 
did we not remember that St. Vincent and the Grenadines is a trucking nation? And therefore, we had enough people with trucks all around the place. We weren't objecting to using Cuban expertise for helping with designs and engineering and what have you. Even though we also believe that we may have had Vincentians with the expertise. But in the spirit of what the Cubans normally refer to as internationalism, they formed this triumvirate. Chavez, Castro, and Gonzalez. And so it may well be that it was thought that it would be let, let's transform it into an internationalist project. So Venezuela will pay something. The Cubans will come as a result of what Venezuela pay. And voila, said this Grenadines will be the beneficiary. It did not occur to the government that it's okay to bring Cuban doctors and nurses where we lack the expertise. It is okay to bring engineers where we lack the expertise. But where we have the expertise, driving trucks and driving heavy equipment, how long have Vincentian been doing that? But we went and ignored them to a large measure. And you know what's ironic? Our truck drivers of them said nothing. That was ironic. They suck salt and they wait till the last minute. And eventually, when they give some of them work, they were in twos. That's it. We love labor. In the event we do, we will always look out for the betterment of our people first. Turks and Caicos Island. Turks and Caicos Island. That's why we asked you earlier in the program, are we putting our people first when we ask you to look at Digicel? Are we putting our people first? Did we put our people first when we were so eager to have the farmers sell their land to the government so that you could then sell the land to Sandals? Are we putting our people first? The people with the Argyle lands, some of whom haven't been paid yet, are we putting our people first? If in a spirit of development, you acquire Marcus de Freitas' property in the heart of Kingston, you end up going to court over Marcus's claim that the property was worth more than you were offering. Law made a decision. You are a practicing lawyer for how many years? You know the law inside out. And after all these years, Marcus can't get the money? Are we putting Vincentians first? Are we? Politically hubristic anxiety in the face of mounting criticism on several matters confronting the Unity Labour Party administration may well have been the cause of Camilo's untimely statement because we insist that it is untimely. Gonzalez the Younger had stated, we get it from Eyewitness News, quote, the Vincentian workers will gain experience and familiarity with the Beaches brand and standards and that they will eventually rotate back through the various sandals properties until they are redeployed to Beaches Bookament Bay when that resort is completed. End of quote. You see, it sounds good for politicians to count the chickens before they are. According to Eyewitness News, Gonzalez also stated that the management of Sandals had noted that there was a new government in the TCI and they were working with them on matters related to work permits and the like, according to IWN. 
Kai with this. Now, understand, he is saying that. Eh? But you heard the minister responsible for immigration, citizenship, labor, and employment services say something different. Eh? While this may be their plan, it is certainly not the plan of this government when we have so many Tils and Caicos Islanders who are out of work. I assure you, we have not had any discussions along those lines. I assure you, we have not had any discussions. He is with Minister of Immigration, Citizenship, Labor, and Employment Services. Yet our boy here is saying that the management of Sanders noted that there was a new government in the TCI and that they were working with them on matters related to work permits and the like. So they bypassing the minister responsible for immigration, citizenship, and all those things. Eh? Or that is a plan, that they're planning to do that sometime in the future. But the, the, the language used, they are working with them. Gives the impression that things have already started, or maybe they're just working on the ideas. You see, Unfortunately, the TCI minister does not appear to have received that memo. Like they forget to send that memo to him. So maybe they're passing through some other conduit. And it may well have been embargoed only to be shared by the Gondals clan and the leadership of Sanders. Well, what else do you want us to say? Because only them seem to know about it. TCI doesn't seem to know about it. But Camilo and the people to whom he makes reference, which is the Sandals people. So instead of letting the Sandals people talk themselves into things, it appears that it is it may well be the hubristic, politically oriented Camilo, like that, anxious to talk about what we are doing to impress Vincentians. But you make this boo boo. Eyewitness News noted that the TCI minister insisted, quote, we must also look at a reciprocal arrangement for our people so they too can benefit from such an exchange where they would leave the Turks and Caicos Islands and be posted on a temporary basis at other Sandals Beaches properties to further enhance their overall growth and development, end of quote. That is looking after your people. That is how you do it. And one can only hazard a guess that in the future, Gonzalez the Younger would be far more circumspect. And leave it to Sandals to talk the thing. Leave it. Leave it. Nobody ahead. Leave it. Leave it to them. You see, we have a way in this country of attempting to suggest that we know it all because we want to impress people. Right? That's why we refer to the problems we have with the vaccine. We have been talking about government's insensitivity and one of the important areas of their crass insensitivity that we wish to bring into focus has to do with the vaccines in this country. We have been making a mess of the vaccine issue. And you know why we're making a mess? Because to begin with, the politicians got into the fray. Presenting themselves as good examples of incentions taking the vaccine. It appears as though our politicians have suddenly become scientists and advocates of the vaccines, etc., etc. Our politicians. That is the first big boo-boo that we have in dealing with the vaccines. That we allow the politicians to lead the way. Why? Why? You want us to follow science. You want us to follow the health authorities. They already make enough of a boo-boo along with the politicians on the way in which we have approached the entire pandemic. You're going to start with the politician. So our politician the leader of government and the leader of opposition somehow believe that they are so heavily influential on all aspects of Vincentian life that if they take the vaccine, wait a minute, 
Oh gosh, boy, everybody will join the line and whine and take the vaccine too. What has happened? What has happened? The people don't trust you all enough with their health. That is what you got. That's why you have the politicians now literally begging people to go and take the vaccine. It is a tacit acknowledgement that the people do not see you as exemplary in relation to their health. That's what they say. You may not agree with it, but that is our view. But remember, you're free to disagree. You see, the politicians appear to have their preferences for the vaccine, though seemingly quietly so in many instances. The challenge is, in getting Vincentians to take the vaccine are manifold. And the politicians are amongst the major causes for the hesitancy of many Vincentians going for the vaccines. It is a question of trust. It is a question of trust. Vincentians have grown particularly circumspect once politicians involve themselves in anything. The loss of confidence in our politicians is now legendary in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. They are not seen as being amongst the most credible people in Vincentian society today. So the politicians have helped in no small measure to bungle any genuine effort at getting Vincentians to vaccinate. You are part of the problem, dear politicians. You are not part of the solution. It is an unfortunate reality that Vincentians no longer appear ready to trust politicians, and this in respect of of just about any aspect of their life, but particularly their health. So the examples set by Gonzales on Friday by taking the vaccines themselves have had no impact whatsoever on the Vincentian populace and their own views relative to the vaccine. But when the politicians realize that they're not getting traction with the people, what have they resorted to? What have they resorted to? Some get up and tell the people, oh, you're being misled. You're being fed misinformation. As if to suggest only what they're telling you is true and only they are the re relevant source of information. The information is everywhere. But now the same people that you had confidence in to elect you to office, you're now suggesting you don't have enough confidence in them that they are literate enough to make valid choices about whether or not they should vaccinate. That's what your politicians, you as politicians, are doing to your own people. Because you believe that they are interested in your politics enough to vote for you. You cannot assume that when they don't follow your lead in respect of vaccination, that suddenly they are bright enough. They don't have enough cognition, understanding of what they read, and what they hear, and what they see. Simply because they're not following your lead. That's one of the worst examples of Vincentian politics. What our politicians have done in this disputed vaccine, in the name, quote-unquote, of protecting people's lives, reflects a despicable truth of just how they perceive Vincentians. And you hear it when they speak. And you wonder if it is that if some of them had the chance, they will bully you 
into accepting the vaccine because they think it's the best thing for you. Suddenly, it doesn't matter what you think, you know. It is what they think is best for you. You can't suddenly, you can't think, you could think enough to make a determination as to whether or not they should govern you. But you can't think enough, you're not bright enough to determine whether or not you should take a vaccine. The examples set have not yielded any traction. In their anxiety to appear to be seeking the very best interests of Vincentians in the face of the pandemic, our politicians have essentially been expressing their own views on people's health. That to some, especially employees of the government, comes across as if there is a carrot and stick as familiar with the days of Congress. Take what we say is good for you or face the consequences of what we are likely to do to you. Remember that kind of phrasing in the days of conquest and colonization? Take what we say is good for you or face the consequences of what we are likely to do to you. Vincentians are literally tired of being bullied, especially when the politicians are not giving them the right to choose. What is now happening with regard to the responses coming from the teachers' union, the public service union, and the police welfare association smacks of the broader national distrust of the politicians' engagement an apparent intervention in their decision-making processes relative to their own lives. Then there is also the matter of the messaging from the authorities. The average Vincentian has come to the recognition that from the very beginning, the officials at the Ministry of Health seemed inept. And when the matter was placed in the hands of Nemo, more than Vincentians, more Vincentians became suspect. While the model messaging of the pandemic was still being spewed across the nation, we had the surge in dengue. Something that is almost always with us, and which was predicted from the early from um, early 2019 long before COVID came on the scene. We were told we would have challenges with dengue in 2020. The fact that Vincentian started dying from dengue more than from the much dreaded pandemic may well have served to create more suspicion all around, emphasizing our lack of readiness and perhaps even incompetence to handle that which has been with us, namely the new kid on the block, COVID-19. No reasonable Vincentian could and should accept the mixed messaging that has been taking place and the level of inconsistency in respect of the pandemic and our response to it. In our previous edition of Just Another Look first aired on Saturday, 27th March, 2021, we address how important, yet embarrassing it was, for patient zero to have detailed her experience on returning to St. Vincent and the Grenadines and trying to get a test, knowing that she had just come from the United Kingdom where the pandemic was wreaking havoc. How many cases does each listener know? How many cases do you know of as listeners where someone you know went for a test and may still be waiting on the result. What about the nonsense argument we appeared to have regarding the definition of our local situation, cluster versus community spread? That nonsense argument we were willing to take up with the World Health Organization. 
insisting that the World Health Organization had wrongly characterized us as having community spread only three or four days later to suggest that we had community spread. The extensions were somehow, and still are, being asked to listen to advice coming from Dr. Gerald Thompson, of all people. Did the ministers of government at any level, at any time, even so much as listen to Gerald speaking as an infectious disease expert before now? Did they at any time? Did they at any time? The same ministers of government that now selling you Gerald Thompson. Like a new piece of sliced bread. Many Vincentians may have long forgotten that Gerald was even a, a medical personnel. Many don't really know him as a medical practitioner. Because they've been pushing him from pillar to post and all sorts of things since government won in 2001. How much, how many assignments has have, have Gerald Thompson had? between 2001 when the government won elections and now where his quote-unquote infectious disease expertise had been marketed to this country as it is now. Is anybody listening to Gerald? Let's ask something. Is Gerald listening to himself? Is he listening to himself? And one wonders how many Vincentians see Gerald Thompson as a medical practitioner. The authorities attempt to suddenly appear to be marketing Gerald as an infectious disease expert may well have thrown salt in a festering wound that was the pandemic itself. Then there is the matter of the long-term consequences of the vaccine. No scientist can as yet answer the questions in this regard since there is no way of advancing time. You just have to take time. So there are a lot of challenges. Recently, April 1st, we are told that the Pfizer-BioNTech coronavirus vaccine that its protection will last for six months after the second dose. That has recently been exposed. And it says in an article in CNN dated 1st April 2021, quote, the question of how long vaccine protection lasts can only be answered once enough time has passed. And while six months of protection is a modest target, it is longer than previously known. That is how things are done. So you can't blame people. For the average Vincentian, it appears that some people in authority assume that many have no time to read and understand what is happening globally. Others, unfortunately, seem to think that once they are comfortable with taking the vaccine, that everybody else should do likewise. All the unions, the public service union, all the unions that we're talking about, the public service union, the teachers union, and the police welfare association, all that they are doing is asking for the respect to be given for the right of the individual to make his or her informed, independent choice. There is absolutely nothing wrong with that. It remains totally unacceptable for some individuals, particularly politicians, to consider themselves so heavily influential that once they have had their shots, they can and must decide and dictate and speak down to others who have not yet done so. Well, like the old people say, nothing na go so. Enough said. You know, their friends, as always, remind you the disappearance on the, on the 19th of November, Sunday the 19th of November 2006, the disappearance of J8VAX piloted by Dominic Gonzalez with Rashid Ibrahim on board, disappeared without a trace. That was 5,202 days ago. 
And today, 3,892 days have gone since the disappearance of another SVGA aircraft, J-8SXY, piloted by Suresh Lakhman. And today, dear friends, we remind you that on the 19th of September 2008, Patricia Bowman was crushed to death in her car on her way to work. We continue to look at how jurisprudence is practiced in this country. The lawyers have all kinds of explanations to give. But perhaps that's why so many lawyers become politicians. They argue themselves to death. They can always justify anything, these lawyer fellas and, and, and ladies. But that's probably why, too, justice is always a lady blindfolded holding a scale. Justice is indeed blind. Enough said. You'll be listening to another edition of Nice Radio's Kalaloo presentation, Just Another Look. Just Another Look is an innovative, exciting, albeit decidedly provocative, and yes, yes, certainly controversial, socio-political analysis of issues of a local, regional, and international nature. Just Another Look is heard only on Nice Radio first aired on Saturdays at 6 p.m., with repeat broadcasts on Sundays at 9 p.m. Remember, catch us on the World Wide Web, www.niceradio.info. Check us out on Facebook and YouTube. I am, of course, (laughs) Keith Joseph. www.bayhillnews.net is the parent body of Bay Hill News Network. We do Facebook Live for church service, funeral service, lecture, sporting activity. For more, contact at bayhillnewsnetwork at gmail.com or call 1784-529-8340. Looking for a place to relax with natural cool breeze and friendly surroundings? Then check the Bay Hill Tree Bar, located at Bay Hill Cane Garden. We have everything a bar will have. We also sell shell twenty. Found the cooking garden, cooking garden at the Bay Hill, Hill Tree Bar. Ship your barrels and household effects to St. Vincent and the Grenadines with SVG Direct. Jumbo barrels, $70. Medium, $60. And small, $50. We ship anything. Uh, name it. We ship it. Vehicles and more. Local agent, Adams Customs and Shipping Agency. Third floor, Baines Building, Kingstown, SVG. Telephone, 1784 458 in Canada, contact Michael 647 569 3285. Jumbi 647 657 7362. Remember, it's free pickup at your convenience, seven days per week, anywhere in the greater Toronto area with SVG Direct.